uh, everyone listen up for a second. I have, I'm, I am muted right now on this phone, but I have on the phone Daniil and Dimitro in Ukraine. And what I want to do is I'm going to unmute the phone and I'm going to tell them that we've got everyone here and that we miss them and we wish they were here and we love them and we wish the best for them. And then I'm going to turn the camera to you guys and, and, and just scan the room. Just make a ton of noise about how much we miss and love these guys and wish they were here, okay? So that's the, uh, that's the plan. Okay. Let me see if I can, I'm so, I, I'm what they call a technum poop, so I'm probably going to mess something up here technical, but we're going to try it. All right. Daniil and Dimitro, can you guys hear me? Yes. You can. All right. Well, um, I met, oh, wait, hold on. I'm being told that I've messed something up technically, which is par for the course. There we go. Okay. Oh, look, there, and I can see what I'm all right, well, hello. Um, uh, we are on the final day of Nikon, and we miss you guys and are so sad that you were unable to make it. And I just wanted to um, uh, give you guys a call on this final day and tell you how much we love you and we're thinking of you and we wish you the best. And so uh, I'm gonna turn the camera now uh, to the audience and uh, scan the room. Hey guys. Gentlemen, we, we really, really are sorry you couldn't make it. Uh, obviously, we understand and uh, we wish you the very best. I hope to see you both soon. For sure. Thank you very much. Sure. See you in Arizona. <laughs> All right. That's right. We'll see you at Level Up. Love you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Oh, you, you start. Yeah, yeah. I will just. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming this morning. We have Greg Biddle, and he will give a talk. I don't want to announce you again, but I can if you want. I think everybody knows who you are here. So Greg Biddle will give a talk about logic and love, the harmony of happiness. And uh, after that, we will have a coffee break, a closing remarks, and finish this new conference. So give it an applause for Greg Biddle. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we are here to talk about love, which we've been here to talk about for a few days, and uh, what better subject is there than love? Uh, loving things in your life, loving the elements of your life, your career, your friends, your lover, the hobbies you engage in, your freedom or to the extent that you have it, loving your efforts to gain it if you don't have it, right? To love, is to value something intensely. That's what love is. It's to value something in the extreme as against something that you like or that you moderately value or that you value very little or that you don't value at all, right? So there's a scale when we're talking about values. And love is a concept that we have to denote the things that we value in the extreme or with an intensity. And this is why it's so important. Who wants to value the things in their life in the extreme? Anybody want that? Yeah, what happens when you value the things, especially the big things in your life, your career, your recreational activities, your friends, your lover, when you value all of those things intensely, what does that amount to? It amounts to loving your life, right? It's, it's, it, those are the elements of your life. And when you value all of those intensely, when you love that, those things, that is loving your life. That is what it means to love your life. It's a great idea. Somebody ought to write a book on loving your life. Oh, I did that. Um, so today, I want to break down 
what it means to value things intensely or extremely and how we can do more of it. Because if we can, and to the extent that we can, we love our lives more. And there's always room for more. So we're, we're looking to love our lives in the extreme. We want to love loving our lives, all right? <clears throat> so I want to break things down. We'll begin by just identifying the areas of life that are significant, the major areas of life that you can and, and want to love things in a, to, to a large degree in or value things to a large degree in so that you can fill your life with love. And I've already named them, but I just want to be very specific here. So there's your career. Thomas talked the other day about the importance of productive work, right? And it really is a central thing in our lives. If you don't have productive work, you just, you, you, you can't feel the kind of self-esteem and, and creativity and all of those things that amount to uh, purpose and meaning, a, a core purpose and meaning in your life. So your, your, your career or your work, or if you're not yet working, your education, which is driving you toward that stuff. So I put career and educational pursuits together because they very much uh, are akin to each other. Um, so that's one thing, career slash education. Another obvious thing is your romantic relationship, if you have one. And if you don't, uh, no doubt, your desire to have one, and therefore you value the effort to find someone you can love and share your values with in an intimate way, uh, in a romantic way. And so that's another huge value, career and education and romantic love. The other really major aspects of life are friendship, right? Friendship, some people have lots of friends, some people just have a few, but for, for most people, friends are a really important aspect of, of a wonderful life and the joy you get from friendships is pretty significant. Recreational activities or hobbies. I don't know what you guys love to do. I love ballroom dancing, rock climbing, and skiing, right? If I have time to go do fun stuff, that's what I wanna go do. And I love those things. So I do them because I love them. I don't go scuba diving or watch football because I could care less about those, right? So again, everything's sort of on a scale and you have to figure out what it is that is going to constitute a life that you can love. And that's what this whole business of being selfish is all about, right? Is, is figuring out what is gonna fill your life with joy. And when we're talking about love, we want extreme joy. So those are the, the main elements. Oh, I should add one more, health. Your health, like if you're not, if you don't keep yourself healthy, you know, everything's gonna tank. So, um, and we'll talk about this. I'm gonna put some diagrams toward the end of the talk uh, on the board here where we'll break some of this stuff down. But before we get there, I want now to make a distinction between two aspects of love that apply to each of these areas of life that I've mentioned. And the two aspects are the emotional aspect and the action aspect. So there's an emotional aspect and an action aspect. We'll take them in turn. The emotional aspect of love is pretty straightforward because we already think of love naturally as an emotion. You feel strongly about someone. You feel intensely passionate about your lover. You get intense, passionate joy by making love to your lover. You feel an intensity about the work that you love to do. I love what I do. I am in my element right now. This is my favorite thing to do is to talk about and communicate important ideas and make crucial distinctions and help people understand the world and their needs more clearly. I love to do that. So I'm, I have this intense joy that comes from doing the kind of thing I'm doing now. That's my career. And so the emotional element is pretty straightforward. We know basically what that means. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. But I did want to bring up the emotional element because it's important to know that there are two elements, and the other element, the one that's not so obvious, is what we need to focus on, and then we're going to integrate them. And that's sort of the theme of the talk, is what is this integration between the emotional element and the action element? So we know that to love is to value, right? It's to value intensely. But what does it mean to value something? To value something is to act to gain or keep it. 
To value is to act, to gain or keep something. If you, if you feel strongly about something or you desire something or you have something but you don't take any action to gain or keep that thing, you can't legitimately be said to value it. So for instance, if a child leaves uh, his bicycle out in the elements to rust, his parents can legitimately say, Johnny, you didn't really love that bicycle. You didn't value that bicycle. Obviously, he didn't, or he wouldn't have left it in the, in the rain to rust. To value is to act to gain or keep. If you have a goal, if you have a thing that you want, and you don't take any action to gain or keep it, what do we call that? Several names you might use, a, a dream, an, an, a, a desire you haven't acted on, a fantasy. But if you really, truly value something, if you really, truly love something, that means you're taking action to gain and keep that thing. You, 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 the emotions alone are not enough. We are not merely emotional beings. We are emotional, physical beings who have to take action in the world. We have to take existential action in order to achieve our values and, and thrive. So there are two elements, and you have to bear this in mind in order to really understand how to love your life, how to love the elements of your life, and how to love the whole of your life. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. So um, among the elements, let me take a sip here. Now, you guys are all studying objectivism, so here's a really easy question. What is the most fundamental action that we need to engage in if we want to figure out what to do to get the things that we want and make our lives great? What's the fundamental thing we have to do? We have to think, right? We have to engage our mind. We have to use reason. And the method of reason is logic, the art of non-contradictory identification, figuring out what things are, engaging in concept, you know, creating concepts, using concepts to build abstractions. You figure out things like, what, what does justice mean? What do individual rights mean? What does it mean to have purpose in life? These are all big abstract words. And we know what they mean because we've engaged in non-contradictory identification. We've said we want to know what things are. We want to push contradictions out of the way and not have them invade our thinking so that we can keep our minds connected to reality. Right? That's objectivity. Well, a key aspect of logic is recognizing and respecting the law of causality. The law of causality. Things act in accordance with their natures and they cannot act in contradiction to their nature. So there's the non-contradiction. And logic helps us to do that. Right? Now, when you apply logic to the realm of human values, you get a really interesting mixture of, of powerful tools. If I want something, if I desire something, that's an end or an effect or a goal I'm after. Can I get that without enacting the cause of that? Can I achieve an end without enacting the means to the end? Of course not. That would be a contradiction. I, I can plan my life out and have in my mind all these things that I want to do. But to make them happen, I have to enact the causes that will achieve those ends. I have to do the things that will make the, those values come into to reality, that we'll realize those values. And this is fairly obvious, but here's the thing uh, when you're thinking of this from an objectivist perspective. This is the essence of being moral, is to think in these terms. This is the essence of being moral. It's the essence of being a good person is taking your life seriously making decisions about how you're going to structure your, your life, your values, the things you want, and then figuring out how to enact the causes that will achieve those ends, right? the means to those ends. 
And if you've read Ayn Rand's essay, Causality Versus Duty, you, you know that she says that you can sum up the objectivist ethics in this beautiful Spanish proverb, God said, take what you want and pay for it. And we all know that Ayn Rand is an atheist, so she doesn't mean literally God said something. What she means there is that reality is what it is. Reality dictates that if you want to function in reality, you have to obey its laws, the laws of identity and causality. So God said means reality has laws. Take what you want means figure out what it is you want in this world and go after that thing. How do you get it? You have to pay for it. That's the pay for it part. What's the fundamental thing you have to do to figure out how to get what you want and engage in action? You have to think about what it will take to get from here to there. God said reality dictates that if you want something, you must enact the causes. You must think and act rationally. This is, what, this is, the, this is really the whole essence of the, of the objectivist ethics. And then we break it down. We have virtues and values and, and principles and all sorts of things to help us do that. But the basic structure of it is reality is a certain way. If you want to thrive and prosper and flourish or whatever you want to call it, then you have to act in certain ways. And the fundamental thing you have to do is think, and then you have to put those rational thoughts into action. So God said, take what you want and pay for it. Now, this is all still very abstract. Like, if we just left with, OK, the secret to life is decide what you want, and then use your mind to go get it and take the actions. We would still be like, well, OK, what do I do? That's, that seems to be sage advice on one level, and then if I try to put it into practice, I'm like, well, aren't, are there parts to this? Yes, there are, and guess what? Objectivism delivers us a whole lot more to work with here. So now, if we know that the purpose of life is to achieve our happiness, right, to figure out what we want, to enact the, the causes to get those things, then we can start to incorporate some of the objectivist tools for this purpose. And two of the main tools for this are organizing your values hierarchically, like getting your values in order, and we're going to talk about that, and in conjunction with that, figuring out at any point in your life, what is my main mission now? What's my main mission, or what Rand would call a central purpose? What's the central thing in my life that I'm kind of focusing on now to try to figure out or accomplish or get done? And this is going to change throughout the course of your life. It, you, you probably already know this. I mean, it changes all the time. If you're a student, your central purpose at that time, or your main mission, is to engage in your educational activities really uh, astutely. So you can figure out, you know, so you can really learn and, and, uh, and create the kind of knowledge in your mind that you need so that you can go do the thing that you're planning to do with this education. If you're in an educational environment, and you don't know what you're going to do with it, then part of your mission at that time is to be thinking about what you might do for a career. So at any point in time, if you don't have a central, a central purpose or a main mission, you can just think of your main mission as being figure out what I want to do, figure out what my main mission should be. So you're really never without a main mission if you put your mind to, to action on this. So, we, know, we need to know what it is, the big thing in life that we're trying to accomplish at a given time. And then there are different spheres of life in which things are big and important and matter. But some of those spheres are so different that you, you, you can value each of them very intensely or very extremely and not regard one as more important than the other. And the two that, for, and you know, everybody's hierarchy of values is his or her own. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about mine just because it's the one I have direct access to. Um, so for instance, my career is extremely important. It's a top value in my life. And I treat it that way. My wife, my romantic partner and relationship there is also an equally top value. I do not place one of these over the other. I say they're, they're two absolutely uh, crucially important values, neither of which is more important than the other. They're just different. They're so different that you can't really compare them. They're, it would be apples to oranges rather than apples to apples. 
So in my hierarchy of values, those are the two things or two of the things that are at the top for me. And we're going to break this stuff down more as we go. Other things that are at the top for me are my health, which is extremely important to me, and my daughter. I have a, Sarah and I have one child, and she is extremely important. Down below, those massively important, extremely uh, uh, rich values for me are friendships. I have some really important friendships. I'm not one of these people who has you know, 85 friends. I have a few friends, and they're very important. And then I have a few other friends that are less important, and a few people we go dancing with, and they're really fun, but I don't know much about them. So they're, they're farther down the line in importance or whatever, or somebody I might go rock climbing with who is also you know, a, a crazy leftist. But we don't do that. We don't talk about that stuff when we're climbing. Instead, we just climb. So there's a hierarchy even within my friendships, right? And then there are my recreational activities. And there's a hierarchy within there. There are certain things I absolutely love to do, climbing, dancing, these kinds of things, skiing. And then there are other things that I'll do because they're fun. Somebody asks me, hey, you want to go surfing? Yeah, I'll go surfing for a day, but it's not that big a deal to me. So you see how you can structure your values in an organized way by thinking about them. How much does romantic relationship matter to me? If I'm in one, is it, a really, is it something I really value? I'm going to really put all my effort into making this thing great? Or is it a tentative one where you're still not entirely certain that this is the right relationship? Either way, it's, there's a difference in, in the value between those two. If you don't yet have a romantic relationship, romance might still be one of your top values in that I really want a romantic relationship, and I'm going to therefore take action to find someone that I can fall in love with and that will love me for who I am and we can have a wonderful romantic relationship together. So it's just, you know, it, it, it's a matter of thinking a lot about what really matters to you and then organizing your values in, the, their relative, in order of their relative importance in your life. And the importance of doing this cannot be overstated. In Ayn Rand's book, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, she makes the point that if you don't have your values in order, you cannot make value calculations. It's not that it's difficult to make value calculations. It's impossible to make value calculations. Think about it. So if I do have my values in order and I have a big paper due tomorrow, uh, in, in the subject I'm studying that really matters to me. And I've written a draft, but it needs a lot of editing. And I'm going to either edit it tonight or not. That's the time, time zone I have for it. I get a call from my friends. They're going dancing. I love dancing. Now, if I don't know what matters more, fun with my friends for an evening or getting this paper edited, how am I going to decide which one to do? can't. There's no, there's no way that you can make that calculation. You can only make that calculation if you know that one of them is more important than the other, contextually, at this point, in this, in this context right here. Doing this thing is more important than doing that thing, because this thing is connected to a bigger value. Right? So by having our values thoughtfully organized, and you have to always make room for your value hierarchy and the elements of your hierarchy to change, right? After, I, after Sarah and I had a daughter, we stopped dancing for about 10 years because we, we, didn't wanna, we, we didn't like the idea of getting babysitters and we didn't want to go out at night and leave our, you know, you can't go out at night and leave your, leave your four-year-old at home. So we just said, that's cool. This is not, that's not in our value hierarchy right now. This other thing has replaced it, spending time with our daughter and reading in the evenings or watching movies or whatever else we could do with that time at home. And you have to allow for that. We'll talk about this more later, but you want to always or regularly reassess your value hierarchy and the, and the things that constitute the life that you want to design. But the point here is that once you have your values beautifully organized and thoughtfully figured out, guess what happens? Living beautifully becomes a science. Making your life the best it can be is now scientific. I call this the math of egoism. 
the math of egoism. Why? Because once your values are in order and you've, you've done due diligence to think about what those values are and why they matter and why they belong in this order and what their relationship is to each other, when you've gone through the thought process and made that decision, you can make value calculations that are flawlessly accurate, just like you can do math with flawless accuracy. It's as true that I should work on the paper tonight rather than go dancing with my friends as it is true that 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's equally true. There's a fact of reality, my value hierarchy, that I've already decided on. That's a fact. And if I go dancing, I'm sacrificing a greater value for the sake of a lesser value. That is a violation of logic. It's a violation of logic to treat one thing that is less important than something else as if it is more important. A sacrifice is a violation of logic. It's a violation of your value hierarchy. <clears throat> logic is our tool for figuring out what things are, how we can put them together, how we can build a beautiful life, how we can love our lives. So you can think about it this way. The Spanish proverb says, God said, take what you want and pay for it. We can convert that, or we can say, God said another thing too. Use logic to love your life. Logic is the means of identifying the values, putting a life together that you can love, doing that in all the various elements of your life that are really important to you, work, education, romance, recreation, friendships, family, if you have family you love, whatever it is that matters to you after you've done, after, after you've thought through these things and thought really carefully and clearly about these things, and then you decide what matters to you, that becomes a fact. That becomes a thing that you created. It's a man-made creation, but it's a fact. And then you treat that fact mathematically, scientifically, with love. You love the thing you're trying to do, and then you put it all into action. So logic and love are, as this talk title uh, suggests, logic and love are the harmony of happiness. When you get these things to work together, you build a beautiful life for yourself. Doesn't mean there aren't going to be downs and ups. Of course there are. Things don't always go smoothly. But at any point in time, regardless of how things are going in your life, you're always at a pivot point whereby you get to decide how you're going to move forward. You know? If bad things have happened, guess what? They're in the past. There's not a damn thing you can do about the past. It's like the metaphysically given versus the man-made. The past is gone. You can't touch it. So wherever you are in life, if things aren't going well now, or if you're like, oh, well, I haven't been doing this, I should have been doing it, don't harp on that. You can't do anything about that. Instead, decide now, moving forward, I'm going to use logic to figure out how to love my life and to take the actions necessary to do that thing. And this is what the objectivist ethics is all about. This is it. This is, the, this is the objectivist ethics in a nutshell. Now, I haven't even mentioned, I barely mentioned the virtues, which are obviously central, and I barely talked about the values of reason and purpose and self-esteem. But they're all implicit in everything that I'm talking about now. And I didn't want to get up here and just tell you, oh, the virtues are this and the values are this. That's, it's, it's important stuff, but I think you guys know enough of that that I'd rather give you a, a, a way of looking at your life and the world so that you can put these values and these ideas and these principles to action. OK, now um, I want to go through, I'm going to give you a few more tools to work with um, that I think tie directly into what we're talking about here and that I think you'll find helpful. These things have been extremely helpful to me. Um, and these are ideas that I have come up with on my own. So the, this is not a part of objectivism. But I think it integrates with objectivism. And I think you will uh, see that it does. And I think you'll, you'll see the value in it. 
The first thing I want to talk about is what I call the 100% rule, or the 100% rule. And this comes, uh, I paraphrase from a, a famous uh, US hockey player named Wayne Gretzky, who said roughly something like this, or these, this is my paraphrase of it, which is stronger for my purposes. 100% of the shots you don't take won't go in. 100% of the shots you don't take won't go in. Now that's true on its face, right? This is, there's, and the reason it's true is because it's right there at the level of an axiom, right? It's, 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 it's like the law of excluded middle. Either you shoot and the, and the puck might go in, or you don't shoot and it won't. There, there's, there's no middle ground here, it's either or, right? And when I first heard this idea and converted it to that language, I forget what his exact quotation is, it's very similar to that, but it's, that, that's not a direct quote from him, but I like it this way. 100% of the shots you don't take won't go in. When I first heard this, I immediately converted, so I was in my 20s and I was single at the time, and I immediately converted it to 100% of the girls you don't ask out won't go out with you. And that's true, if you think about it. And it served me very well, because it reminded me that you have two alternatives anytime you meet a girl you would like to ask out. You don't ask her out, and you never go out with her, or you do ask her out, and maybe she'll go out with you. So it's not a definite. Pardon? What was my success rate? I'm not going to say that on camera. <laughs> not going to say that on camera. Um, but I'll say this. Uh, I'll say this. Uh, this principle helped me meet my wife and date my wife and marry my wife. So uh, it worked. I'll leave it at that. And, uh, <clears throat> and, the, and the point here is that if you can break things down to essentials, sometimes people talk about you know, first principles and thinking in first principles. I like to think of things as proximate fundamentals. What's the fundamental in the area in which I'm concerned? What, so I'm, I'm thinking about dating. Well, what's the, what's the fundamental there? Well, I, some of the fundamentals include you gotta find somebody who shares values with you, who has the kind of sense of life that you love. You know, romance is really a lot about sense of life. You know. That, that's why the people, you, someone you fall in love with is going to have a similar sense of humor and he or she is going to like the same kind of art generally that, and then you'd be able to talk because all of those are sense of life elements. They're sort of a preconceptual, sort of a, a metaphysical view of the world, of, of the, the nature of the world and the nature of people and what's important and what's not important, right? And so that's one of the things that is, is, is a fundamental in the realm of romance. Another thing for me that's a fundamental in the realm of romance is 100% of the girls you don't ask out won't go out with you. Or ladies, uh, you can put that the other way too. 100% of the guys you don't ask out won't go out with you, but you also have the alternative of flirting. And if you flirt, it reminds us to enact the 100% rule. So either way, um, and I don't, I'm, I'm sure I'm wading into controversial territory right now by saying there's a difference between men and women, but have at. <laughs> um, so the 100% rule is, is really powerful because it obviously doesn't just apply to dating, it applies to everything in life. 100% of the business plans you don't write won't get funded. 100% of the papers you don't spend the correct amount of time on will not serve you in your life. 100% of the hobbies you don't try, you won't know whether they're any fun for you. Right, 100% of the conferences that you don't come to won't be a source of inspiration and uh, future value for you. So it applies everywhere. You can apply the 100% rule in, in a way that reminds you that life really is, in many senses, black and white. Things are black and white. Either or is everywhere. Yes, there's gray all over the place, but there's also either or and it's everywhere, which brings me to the next thing uh, that I wanna, next tool that I wanna uh, give you that I think you'll find as helpful as I have. So we have these principles, uh, the objectivist values, 
the objectivist virtues, you know, reason is your only means of knowledge and your basic means of living, so rationality is the commitment to using reason as your means of understanding the world, selecting values, and pursuing values. Now, that doesn't mean you ignore your other mental faculty, your emotional faculty. It would be crazy to ignore that. That's the whole point of, of loving life. Love is the big emotion we're trying to have more of. So you're not ignoring that, but you're not going to treat your emotional faculty as if it were your means of knowledge or your means of cognition. It's not. It's something else. Your emotional faculty is your means, it's your psychological means of experiencing and enjoying your values. Or feeling sad when your values are, are harmed or disruptive. If a good friend dies and you feel really sad, that's appropriate. So your, your emotional faculty is there to, with lightning-like uh, speed, give you an indication of what is important or not important or, uh, or wonderful or horrible or whatever the case may be, given your values, right? If you have a favorite football team and they're in a big tournament and they win, you feel great. That's what your emotions are for. They're like, yay, and you feel really good. But your emotions, if you're, if you're gonna bet on that game before it happens, you don't wanna let your emotions guide the betting or you're gonna lose a lot of money, right? And if you do bet on the team and they lose, then you feel rotten, right? And there's your emotions doing what they're supposed to do. But they're just not your means of, of cognition. So you, one thing you want to do is really understand that there's a separation between these two mental faculties that we have. And then use reason in the most methodical way you can to create a, a life that gives you the most emotional pleasure and joy over time that you can. That's called pursuing happiness. And here's a really interesting tool for that. So <clears throat> we have principles, we have virtues, we have things we've committed to. And I'll start with something sort of more minor rather than going to the virtues or big things. So let's say I commit to getting up at five every morning because I know that if I get up early, I can get like three to four hours of work done before the regular business day starts and that's really good because I work, I function really well in the morning. My IQ is maybe average in the morning. By the end of the day, it's in the, it's in the toilet. <laughs> so something like that. Um, and so I know that I need to be up early to do my best work. So I commit to that. I can take a commitment like this and I can think of it this way. So here's my commitment. And here's my failure to uphold it. And this is the law of excluded middle, this line right here. I think of this. Oh, can you guys over here see this? Yeah, let's move it that way a little bit. That works. OK. So there, there are a few lines here, or two lines here. Actually, there are three. Um, I call this principle as plateau, principle as plateau. This is the plateau or the moral high ground, the place I want to be and stay. Why? Because that's where my life goes best. This is commitment to all the life-serving principles and uh, values and virtues and commitments that I know if I uh, abide by these things, I'll make my life great. So you can put anything on, look, we have disappearing ink. <laughs> what fun. OK, well, we'll do the disappearing. I'm going to use my hands. You, you saw that clearly enough that actually it, it doesn't matter whether you can see that, because it's such a simple diagram now that we can, work, we can work perfectly fine without it. So you've got the moral high ground. I am committing to getting up every day at 5 so that I can do this work. If I miss that, if, if I violate that commitment one day, then I'm on the slope, right? You've heard of a slippery slope argument. This kind of ties into that. I mean, you can ask more about that in the Q&A because I'm, I'm applying this, this uh, uh, moral high ground or principle and plateau here to 
ethics and the achievement or the pursuit of values, you can, it also applies in epistemology and other areas as well, which we can talk about if you want. But for right now, I put a commitment on there. I'm going to do this thing. Now, if I miss it, if I violate it once, I have indeed violated a principle or a commitment that I know was better for my life, unless there was some mitigating circumstance. I stayed up, I couldn't get sleep the night before, and I needed the sleep in order to get some other things done in the afternoon, so if I got up at five, it was gonna be a problem. But all things uh, equal, uh, the goal is to just get up at five. So I decide to do that, and uh, I miss it or I don't. My goal is to stay on the moral high ground. If I go over, I know, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Where should I go? Back up here. Stay committed to the things you know are good for your life. You can do the same with honesty. You find yourself faking reality to achieve something. And you remind yourself, ooh, oops, shouldn't have done that. That's bad. I'm going to get back up here on the moral high ground. I'm not going to do it again. I'll atone for anything that I did wrong in that meantime so that I have a clear conscience and it reminds me of the importance of not pretending that facts are other than they are. You can do it with any aspect of a romantic relationship that you're in. We've decided that we're gonna do this in this relationship through conscious thinking about what's best, so we've committed to this. And you, oops, I didn't do that. Get back up on the moral high ground. You can always think of a principle as being on the plateau because the reason a principle is a principle is because it's a truth that you've identified. And the reason a moral principle is a moral principle or a moral commitment or a life-serving commitment is a life-serving commitment is because you, through conscious thinking, decided that it was. Now, you might change your mind. You might one day say, I'm not getting up at 5 anymore. I've realized that getting up at 7 works better for me. Fine, change your commitment. But whatever your commitments are or whatever your current knowledge is, about what you think will make your life the best it can be, you want to think of that as the moral high ground, the place you want to stay. When you, if, if you violate something like that, you don't get struck by lightning. There's not a guy in the sky that's going to send you to hell to burn forever for having committed a moral crime or something. That morality is not about that. Morality is about life and the law of causality. God said, take what you want and pay for it. And the way to pay for it is to take seriously the means of achieving love in all these areas of life. You want to love your career. You want to love the work that you do. You want to be juiced about everything in your life because the sum total of that is a life that you love. I actually define success as living a life you love in harmony with your nature. Living a life you love in harmony with your nature. Living is all the action stuff, right? That's the verb. Thinking, planning, acting, revising, correcting, atoning if you do something wrong, whatever. It's, the living part is the verb. Living a life you love in harmony with your nature. The harmony with your nature part is both your metaphysical nature, what kind of animal am I? I'm a rational animal. That means I have to use my mind to figure out what things are, how I can achieve goals, how to make my life great. And then there's your personal nature. Oh, I'm, so for, for me, I'm an introvert. I'm, um, I'm very much, uh, you know, I, I like to be alone most of the time. Um, and uh, I don't like loud noises. You, we all have our, our personal quirks and, and, and idiosyncrasies and differences. So I have my own nature, right? And other people have their nature. Some, some people are gay, some people are straight, some people love football, some people don't. So whatever your nature is, whatever your, your present identity based on your choices and values is, you wanna be true to that. You wanna, you wanna live in harmony with that nature. I advocate radical self-acceptance in this, in this regard. Who am I, what do I love, what do I wanna do? And I'm going to use my mind to do those things. And I don't care what other people think about me or what they think about my, my choices in this area. As long as I know they're moral, I'm, you know, if, if I'm doing something immoral, if I'm doing something that's anti-life, then that's a problem. But insofar as my decisions are about me, you know, I, I, I find the people who appreciate me for that, and that's who I hang out with. So you're using your mind to identify your nature, your human nature, and your personal identity, 
the thing that makes you special, the thing that makes you you, and you're using logic to love your life. And there's the harmony of logic and love. So I hope you find these tools helpful. I have more. I don't know how much time. Do we have time for a Q&A? I, I had a 10-minute thing. And the 10 minutes is to the end of when I can talk, or is to the end of the whole thing? Uh, we have five minutes left for the talk and then Q&A. Oh, good. OK, good. Then I'll talk. Uh, let me see if I want to say more. We'll start the Q&A early. Yeah, let's start the Q&A now. Uh, we'll have a longer Q&A. And uh, yes? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, you and I have been talking a little this day. Uh, everyone who doesn't know me, I'm Melanie from Armenia. And I'd love to ask you, or for moms, this question now. Uh, what's the one piece of advice you would give to young uh, people, like people in, in their 20s? I mean, about the life, what to do, what not to do. Just one mm -hmm. piece of advice and why. One piece of advice for people in their 20s on how to love their lives um, I, I, I mean, there's, there's certainly only one thing I could say, and I, I have to say, read Ayn Rand's books, because that's where this stuff, now, I, what I'm saying here today is my own words and my own interpretation of Ayn Rand's ideas. I'm not up here reading. I could have gotten a Rand book and just read it to you guys, and then you would be hearing Rand. You're not hearing Rand, you're hearing me. But uh, I think that my understanding of Rand is quite solid and, uh, and that I'm imparting to you genuinely accurate meaning of, of what this philosophy is. I got all of the things that I think are powerful, either from Ayn Rand or from Leonard Peikoff or from some other great thinkers. Uh, there's a whole lot of self-development packed into my own philosophy. So my philosophy consists of objectivism plus other ideas that I have uh, discovered are true and powerful. Those ideas are not a part of objectivism, but they integrate with it, and they're super powerful. And I call this my super system, my own super system. It's all the ideas that in my world uh, work for me. And I would advocate that young people build their own super system. Figure out what's true. Figure out what's good for your life. Take those truths seriously. Apply logic to loving your life, the whole point here. So, but I think the most important thing of all of that is to read Rand. Read uh, obviously, her fiction, um, the Fountainhead and, and Atlas Shrugged, but her nonfiction is super rich. The virtue of selfishness and philosophy, who needs it, I think, are the two, for me, from my perspective, the two most important of her nonfiction works. Um, some of the essays in philosophy, who needs it, are particularly powerful. Causality versus duty is in that uh, volume, and uh, the metaphysical versus the man made is in that volume, and those two essays alone are worth. I mean, billions of dollars, I suppose, if you think about their, the, the net value of them to, to, to human beings. I mean, you, could, you probably couldn't even estimate the value of just those two essays. So, and then there's the objectivist ethics and the virtue of selfishness and all of the other great essays in there. So read Rand and then take seriously the business of building your own full worldview that incorporates, I incorporate this thing from Wayne Gretzky, the 100% rule. I, if, if, if I read a book by James Clear, Atomic Habits, another absolutely mind-blowingly powerful book uh, for self-development. How to build good habits that make your life great and how to break bad habits, habits that are, that are you know, causing you trouble. So read Rand and then read other great stuff and integrate all that stuff into a worldview of your own that serves you well. Thank, thank you. Yes. So um, do you have any... Uh, advice on how to choose between two values that are of equal importance within your hierarchy of values when you have to prioritize one, how? Yeah, so how do you choose between two values that are equally important when you absolutely have to prioritize one? Um, this almost never happens because if you really think through something and bring in all the context necessary, you can usually figure out, well, this thing is at least slightly more important. Maybe it's more urgent. Maybe they're both equally important, but one of them is urgent. And there's the difference that makes the difference. Or maybe they're both equally important, but, um, but uh, one of them involves other people who are very important to you also. And that's the difference that makes the difference. Almost invariably, something will tip the scales. If, however, you get to a point where uh, 
the scales can't be tipped at all, and you're literally just sort of stuck in the middle, then remember the, uh, I don't know where this comes from, but remember the story about the mule who is standing here, and there are two bales of hay equal distance from the mule, and he's hungry, but because the bales are equal distance and they're the same thing, he can't decide which one to go to, and he just stays there until he dies of hunger, right? So it's a bad idea to not make the decision, right? You have to make a decision. If you literally cannot make a decision between two things, here's the thing, action is life, or life is action. So if, if they're literally the same, flip a coin and make, it, and make a decision. And if the coin flip, if it goes heads and it means you have to go this way and you feel something rotten about that, you know that that's the other, <laughs> you should go the other way. Ab abort the coin toss and do the thing that you now have discovered is the right thing to do. I, that's the way I would put it. But if you, if you really do take the time to think through your values, it's almost a certainty that, you, it, it, that you're not going to encounter these kinds of things, um, would, would be my suggestion. Uh, yes? Well, sometimes in life, when we try to prioritize things, we give some things uh, the wrong priority. Sometimes we get illusioned by them. How do we make sure that we got our priorities right? And how do we make sure we don't fall into that situation? or what to do when we find it, because we always find it too late that we, uh, we cry out is wrong. Yeah, great question. So if, if, you, if you misprioritize something and you realize that you've done that, uh, what can you do about that, and how can you avoid getting into that situation? So the first thing I want to say there is, look, you can plan all you want in life, and things aren't always going to go the way you plan. It's, that's just not the way that, that the world is. Planning is a tool for dealing with, the, with reality from any, van, from, from any given vantage point, given your full context of knowledge and the values that you know you want. You can make a choice that, that seems absolutely rational, given all of your things, to go do something. And then you know, the building that you go into to do that thing can have a fire, right? <laughs> Catch, you, anything can happen beyond your control. So you have to recognize, A, that, that, that many things are beyond your control. B, you have to recognize that we are fallible. Just because we're using reason doesn't mean we're going to come to the correct conclusion all the time. But how is it we figure out when we have drawn the wrong conclusion? It's by the use of reason. And then how is it that we can correct that and re-engage our mind to figure out what is the right thing to do now? Again, by means of reason. So reason is self-correcting if you use it as a matter of principle. Sometimes it may take longer to correct things that you, that you get wrong, and sometimes it goes pretty quickly. But you don't have any other means of doing it. Reason is your means of knowledge. It is your means of figuring things out. So you just keep using that until you can get things right. Now, as to how to in ensure that you don't have many of those kinds of situations, plan, think, really spend some time. I go on two to three walks a day. Walking is extremely helpful to me for thinking. I think at a much higher level when I'm walking than I do if I'm sitting or just standing in a room or something. So I go for walks, and usually they're about 30, 30 minutes each. And that sounds crazy, because I do. I'll, I'll walk an hour and a half, sometimes even, even up to two hours a day. I will be out. Well, I live in Southern California, which, where you can walk uh, every day uh, of the year, pretty much. So uh, I'm fortunate that way. But the reason I do that is not only for the little bit of exercise that I get from it, which is significant, but it's because I do my best thinking. And so commit to using your mind really, really regularly, carefully, and um, and you know, pointedly about get very serious about what you want in life. Get very serious about what kind of plans you can make to help you most likely achieve those goals. And then if for some reason you have trouble achieving them, use reason again to pivot and figure out what you can do next. Um, yes? Uh, so I kind of have two questions that are interconnected. Uh, first of all, uh, how does a person um, protect themselves against being biased towards agreeing with a position just because uh, it's under the label of some philosophy? Uh, and in, in regards to that, for example, what, what are the things that a person should like, uphold as values to be able to call themselves an objectivist? 
Okay, so there's two questions in there. How do you protect yourself from, uh, from uh, falling into agreement with something just because it comes under a philosophy and, and you don't necessarily know everything yet? Yes. And then what constitutes an objectivist? Okay, so I'll take them in order. Um, the thing you have to do to ensure that you don't fall into some kind of a, um, uh, of a, uh, a bias towards something that you really don't know whether it's true or not. So you, you, come, you, you discover objectivism and you start reading Rand's books and you're blown away by this woman's intelligence and the way that she's putting things together. And it can be very easy, and I've seen it happen many times, that people just start adopting her conclusions, because she draws a lot of conclusions, uh, but they adopt the conclusions without understanding the reasoning or what stands under those things to connect them to reality, right? I like to think of understanding, the concept of understanding, as very, very similar to the meaning of the word. To understand something means to know what ideas stand under that idea and ultimately connect it to reality. That's what it means to understand something. Same with making sense. If something makes sense, what that means is that this abstraction, what is justice or whatever, that it makes it to the sensory level in your mind. You can see an effect or you can perceive the facts that give rise to the need of this concept. And this is really what objectivity is all about. It's keeping your mind connected to reality. And it can be very easy to get sort of swept up into somebody's very logically connected philosophy like Rand's and not understand the things that you're reading about yet, but feel like, well, these conclusions must be true. And, and you, want to, you do want to be careful not to just adopt conclusions when you don't know the full meaning of it. So the thing to do is be aware of the, of the possibility that that can happen and focus on asking yourself, do I really see the facts that give rise to this conclusion or the argument that, that, that holds here? And one of the best ways to do that is to put any argument in your own words. Don't just rely on the wording that Ayn Rand or Leonard Peikoff or any other philosopher uses to draw, draw a conclusion. Look at those and then say, can I put this in my own words and point to facts and examples in my own world, in my own life, that support this idea? If and when you can do that, you understand the idea. You then own the idea, you then know it's true. And that's the most important thing is to, is to do that. Um, I wrote a short essay, I think it's pamphletized in, in, um, in one of the pamphlets here, or maybe not, but anyway, you can find it online. It's titled, Ayn Rand Said is Not an Argument. And it, it goes to the core of this kind of thing. Just because Ayn Rand said something doesn't mean it's true. Right, and we, 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 just like it is for everyone else, just because I said something is not true, just because you said something is not true. The question is, does that thing connect to reality, and, and do you know the things that connect it to reality? Um, as for who is an objectivist, I urge you not to spend too much time on this question, because it doesn't really matter who is and isn't an objectivist. What matters is who is and isn't active-minded, interested in figuring out what's true, interested in identifying the principles that we have to live by to thrive personally and to live in harmony with others. That's the project of objectivism. That's the purpose of objectivism. So what you're looking for is not people who can say, I'm an objectivist, or you could say that he's not an objectivist. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily something to focus on. Most importantly, you should never, quote, strive to be an objectivist because that's putting the cart before the horse. It's treating objectivism as something that's absolutely good and true, and you're striving to be that, but if you're striving to be it, it means you don't already understand what makes it true. So you're, it's a stolen concept, really. You're using the idea of true and good while, uh, while disconnecting that from the, the means of knowing what's true and good. Here's when you become an objectivist, whether you like it or know it or not. When you have read Rand's works, you understand Rand's works. So there's four things. You've read Rand's works. You understand her works. You regard them as true because you can see, the, see how these ideas connect to reality in your own mind. And most importantly, you then act as a matter of principle in accordance with these truths because you know they're true and because you know they're good for your life. 
So you've got to read Rand, understand Rand, recognize that these ideas are true, and then live by these principles. If you are doing those four things, if you've done those four things, you're, you are an objectivist, whether you call yourself one or not, because that's what it means. You, agree, you, you, you understand Rand's philosophy, you agree it's true, you act on it as a matter of course. If somebody does the first, they read Rand's works, and they don't really understand them, they certainly can't be an objectivist. If somebody does understand them, but they don't think they're true, then they're not an, uh, then you wouldn't want to call them an objectivist. They, they disagree with Rand. If they do know they're true, and yet they violate those principles in action, then they're not an objectivist. They're just somebody who's mouthing the words that I'm an objectivist. Um, so, I mean, it, it's not a trivial question, who is and isn't an objectivist, but it's definitely not something to focus on in your own life. You never strive to be an objectivist. Strive instead to understand, to use your own judgment, to stand your ground when you don't understand something. One of the most important words you can, uh, uh, phrases you can know and, and keep in mind when you are learning objectivism, and all through life in every area, is I don't know. I don't yet understand this, and so I'm not accepting it as true uh, until or unless I do. And if you maintain that, then you're the most important thing of all, and that is an independent thinker. And that's really the centerpiece of Rand's philosophy, if you think about it. She almost regarded, so she, for a while, while she was writing The Fountainhead, until she finished Atlas Shrugged, at, or until she was writing Atlas Shrugged, she thought that this, the central virtue of objectivism was independence not rationality. She later decided that it was rationality, and I think there's good reason for that, because rationality is something you need regardless of whether you're in a social environment. Independence really only comes up as an alternative if you have the alternative of focusing on reality yourself or focusing on other people and treating their views and opinions as if they're more important than reality. That's when second-handedness versus first-handedness or independence versus you know, uh, following the, the tribe uh, comes into play. And so if, you, if you've read The Fountainhead, you, I mean, The Fountainhead is just a play out of the, the difference between uh, independence and collectivism in the soul of a person. And um, so really, I, I, and so I really still think, because we do live in a social environment, I really regard independence as, as the centerpiece of this philosophy. And rationality is right there with it. I would sort of put those together. Um, and if you're living on an island, then you don't have to worry about independence. But you're not living on an island, so keep that, keep that in front of you at all times. Yep. Uh, yes? Uh, I'm listening to discussion for the sake of clarity. This is not how I think. But some people might argue that uh, even if they live by the principles that you mentioned, they, uh, you know, they, uh, they have rational thinking, they make the same decisions as us, they may, they may not have the same results. Because maybe they are underprivileged, I don't know, some is that, uh, they are from some disadvantaged group, whatever. How would you respond to this, uh, let's say, criticism? So some people, so you're saying that somebody might understand these ideas, but they come from, say, an underprivileged group. Yeah, they apply them the same way we do, but yeah. uh, maybe they don't reach the same results because, uh, yeah. because of, I don't know, their social background. Or, or they may apply the principles and just come to different conclusions. Yes. So both, so there's really two questions in there. There's what about when people have these ideas and apply the ideas but come to different conclusions about things. And then there's what about the fact that uh, given these ideas, d different people have different contexts. Somebody might come from an underprivileged environment. Uh, you know, he's born into a poor family in a rotten country where there's, the government is lording it over everybody. Or, or just a poor family in the United States versus a wealthier family in the United States or having rotten parents rather than good parents. So yeah, there's all sorts of different contexts. So um, uh, on the first question, uh, people might come to, you know, is, is, is it possible and what do you do when people come to different conclusions using the same basic principles? Yeah, life is complex. I mean, we're, we, we, you know, first level concepts, dog, cat, bird, you know, that stuff's really easy. You get to animal, things could start getting more abstract. You get to mortality and justice and individual rights and love and all the really, really abstract concepts and things get, it gets, it gets difficult. So. We are going to come to different conclusions. Uh, I have some very good friends who have the same philosophy that I do, and we've come to different conclusions about important issues. And usually, if we spend some time and talk those things through, one of us will find that, oh, I was missing that element there, and thank you for the correction. And so my big thing is always be eager 
to stand corrected if somebody shows you that you're wrong. It's like, thank you. You, you help me get, it, get away from that error. Errors are not good for your life, right? So we want to get better. So just remember that uh, thinking at high levels is very complicated, and you are going to come to different conclusions with other people. Just in the business that I work in, at, at Objective Standard Institute, we got a bunch of super smart people working with us, and we have Friday philosophy discussions. We will go down a rabbit hole to, to you know, suss out some issue, and there's disagreement on that call. But usually over time, if not on that call but down the line, Somebody is able to point out to the people who he's disagreeing with, oh, well, there's this element, you know, or either it comes from that way and he clears it up for them, or vice versa, it could go the other way. Um, but reason should always win, ultimately. Reason is the thing because what it does is it keeps our mind connected to reality so that we can live in reality, and you're just, that's what you're looking for. If you have ideas that aren't connected to reality, they can't serve your purposes in reality. As for people who come from uh, less you know, uh, disadvantaged backgrounds or are less fortunate than we are, I'm one of these people who just could not have been more fortunate in, in, in a sense. I mean, my parents loved our, their kids very much. They were reasonably, you know, they were middle class. They had reasonable wealth. Uh, I was born in the United States of America. Uh, at, you know, at a time that was uh, a great time to be born. So I'm one of the people who, who just really got, got lucky in that regard, and there are certainly a lot of people that aren't lucky. And so, um, yeah, they, however, they face the same reality that we do. Their context is different. Uh, look at our friends in, in Ukraine right now. Um, not, I mean, they couldn't come here because they're not allowed to leave the country because they're of, of age to be drafted to fight a war because they're being attacked by Russia. Uh, that's a crap situation if ever there was one. That's a really unfortunate situation. Or think of a child who's born into a family of just rotten parents who are verbally or perhaps even physically abusive, and what are these kids going to do? Well, uh, all of that's awful, but we can't change that it happened. We can only advise what to do now. And the thing that we should advise them about what to do now is get the hell away from your parents I mean, if you're, if you're too young to get away and they're really bad, go try to get, it, get emancipated. Go to a judge. I don't know where, where, whether you can do it where you live. But in the United States, if your parents are really bad, you can go get emancipated and get away from them. Um, but you do what you have to. Use your mind. It's, just, it's really the same thing. It's just in dire circumstances that, that we're talking now. You still have to do the same thing. Think about your life. Think about what you want. Think about what your alternatives are. Get away from bad things. If you have bad people in your life, parents, friends, a, a relationship, anything, get the hell away from them. <laughs> get away from bad people. If people are rotten and bad for your life, leave. Um, and then, I mean, the, the world of successful people is filled with stories of people who came from nowhere and made fortunes and made themselves very successful. Now, making a lot of money is not the equivalent of being happy. Uh, a lot of rich people are very unhappy because they have a rotten philosophy and they don't, they don't know what matters in life. So I don't, I don't mean to imply that, but the point is that almost anyone in almost any circumstance, unless they're completely under coercion, um, you know, if you live in North Korea, I, I don't know what to say except try to escape. Um, but no matter what your circumstance, the answer as to what you should do is always the same. Use your mind the best you can. Get away from the bad circumstances. Try to build a life you love. And in my view, you should do literally anything you can as long as you're not violating people's rights. So I, would, I tell people who are not, uh, who, who, are having, who want to move to America but can't because of America's crappy uh, uh, immigration law, I say, um, well, this isn't advice, but if I were you, because I can't give advice on camera especially, if I were you, I would say to hell with those laws and I would get here anyway. Uh, and that's, that would be my, uh, that, that's what I would do. I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise anybody to do that per se, but, um, but that would be my advice. So you just have to do the best with, with what you have. I think we have room for a couple more. Yes. yes thank you. So my question is, how do directors love and acceptance in case of intergenerational conflicts and misunderstandings? You know, in our society, there are people with collectivistic mindset and background, and there are younger generation who are individualistic. And what is much more important, how to make that love and acceptance mutual? Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. 
So how to deal with intergenerational differences and conflicts. Um, and we, you know, this is a really big deal because um, a younger generation comes up, particularly in the United States, it's really gotten bad because <coughs> uh, the United States uh, educational system, starting with uh, kids getting educated through progressive education in grade school, and then they get to college and they get hit with postmodernism, and it's just bad, bad, bad all the way through. And the whole thing is you belong to a tribe and your identity is a tribe and you're against the other tribes and everything's a power struggle. And so it just, the, the, these things get exacerbated to the nth degree because of the educational system. And then you have young people warring against the, uh, the older people because the older people want to hold on to at least some of the values that constitute America or whatever. How do you deal with this nightmare? Um, the only way you can deal with it is to try to talk to people and get them to realize that human nature is real. We are a certain kind of being. We have a certain identity. That identity includes a rational faculty which enables us to understand the world, a rational faculty that enables us to have conversations with each other without necessarily accepting others' conclusions. It enables us to engage in thoughtful discourse to try to figure things out. And because we have this same nature, there are certain facts of reality that come with it that are absolutes, that cannot be touched. For instance, you may not use force against me. Why? Because when you use force against me, it stops me from acting on my own judgment, which means it stops me from acting fully as a human being. That's why if you put me or Frederick Douglass in a cage and treat him as a slave, right, you are you are disabling him from living as a human being. Why? Because he can't act on his judgment. Our ability to act on our judgment is what, what is, is, is essential to our being and human beings and living a human life. So we have to agree, as Ayn Rand says in her essay for the new intellectual, she says basically this, there are two fundamentals that everyone has to agree on to be civilized. One is that emotions are not a means of cognition. Emotions are not our means of knowledge. Just because you feel something to be true doesn't make it so. What is your means of knowledge? Reason. So we've got to, we've got to agree on that. And people who don't, people who say, well, if I believe it's true, it's true. Or if my tribe says it's true, it's true. You have to say to them, that's not rational. And, and I think you know that it's not. And, and hold their feet to the fire. Don't pretend with them. Say, you, you can pretend that your tribe's views constitute reality, or you can pretend that faith is a means of knowledge, but I'm not gonna pretend with you. Ayn Rand actually called, if you do pretend with them, she called that compound second-handedness. They're in effect saying, we're pretending and we want you to pretend with us. And if you say, okay, I'll pretend with you, that's compound second-handedness. She says, don't do that. Don't pretend with the pretenders. Tell them that they're pretending, you know they're pretending and you won't do it. So that's the first thing. Uh, emotions are not a means of cognition. The second thing is no man has a right to use physical force against another person because it violates the other person's ability to live as a human being. And those are, those are the core things. And anyone who cannot agree on those two principles is by choice uncivilized. They, they cannot be dealt with in a civilized way. You don't know what they're going to do. They might attack you because if they feel they should attack you or if they have faith that they should attack you, that means that they know in their mind, faith or feelings is a means of knowledge, that, that means they know they should attack you. So it, it turns them into wild animals. And as Rand says, what do we do with wild animals? We, we have to shoot them. Uh, and I'm not saying you shoot people just because they're being irrational, but if they attack you, if their irrationality leads to an attack on you, when, we, when the United States gets, uh, gets attacked by the, uh, the, the uh, uh, jihadists who flew planes into to our buildings right, and killed those people, that's an attack. Why did we get attacked? Because they were treating faith as a means of knowledge, and then they used their conclusions, yes, we should kill the infidels, to, uh, to attack us. This is why, as Rand says, faith and force are corollaries. And, and, and faith leads to force, it does. So this is why we have, you, you, faith is really bad and going by feelings is really bad. You have to go by reason. So this, this is the kind of thing that we have to get across to people is that uh, reason is our only means of knowledge and force is antithetical to human life so we've got to extricate it from human relationships. And, and people can get that if they're willing to think. So thank you.
All right, thank you all.